Thank you. All right, lock it up, please. In August 1993, a movie cast and crew gathered in a pecan grove near Americus, Georgia to film To Dance with a White Dog for the Hallmark Hall of Fame. The heat was oppressive, the bugs were annoying, and the days were long. But everyone seemed to sense that there was something special happening in front of the camera as Hume Cronin and Jessica Tandy brought Sam and Cora Peake, the characters from Terry Kay's award-winning book, to life for the screen. Why would these two actors, still performing well into their 80s when most of their contemporaries have retired, choose to put in 12-hour days in the blistering late summer heat? I love it. I feel better when I'm working. I'm much more, uh, I have more energy when I'm working. I get up in the morning with a purpose to go to work. And I, it's a, luckily for me, it is a work that I really, really enjoy. Cronin and Tandy, who were married in 1942, have appeared together on stage and screen several times in their long careers, including their 1987 appearance in Foxfire for the Hallmark Hall of Fame. In Foxfire, as well as to dance with the white dog, they portray characters who must deal with issues that face most older Americans today. Independence, dignity, and the loss of a spouse. I'll be here. Always. Was that more difficult for two actors who know each other so well and have such a close relationship off screen? No, it's easier. I think we have a great deal, we've been married for 50 years, we have a great deal of experience together. We, we, I think if uh, I had somebody who was not Hume playing it with me, or vice versa, the sense of humor between the, the two of them would be lost because they would be concentrating on, the, on the, the loss rather than the life. This is not a tragic story. This is a very affirmative story about a character, me, who is facing his end. It's a man who's fighting to retain his independence and not be smothered by well-intentioned love. And he, he says, I, I think I can take a speech out of the film. You know, he, he's talking to his grandson. Like your mother and your Aunt Carrie and your uncles. Everybody's keeping an eye on Mr. Sam. They arrive like runners in a relay race, and they're always so surprised to see one another. Oh, I didn't know you were coming. What a pity I have to go now. <laughs> what they don't understand is, I may be lonely. Doesn't mean I don't want to be on my own. I think the relationship between people over a period of time uh, the sense of knowing one another and the sensitivity. And that was certainly true of my parents. I think that's what my father missed so much when my mother died. And that whole experience of loneliness and what the white dog filled in that, uh, in that, in that void was very important to the story. Uh, I saw that. And, and I did not know about that, the power of that relationship between my parents until actually after my mother died. And I saw the boy, the loneliness that uh, my father had experienced. This is, uh, yes, a very special shoot because the two stars, but also because it's a true story. I mean, it is all based on Terry Kay's experiences with his, uh, his father. And so what's been special has been recreating that, the environment, finding the white dog, everything. The film features many beautiful locations, but one is particularly noteworthy. While scouting for a pond for a scene where Hume Cronin goes fishing, someone suggested the private pond of former President Jimmy Carter in nearby Plains, Georgia. Perhaps because he created the Georgia Film Commission while he was governor, Carter said yes. His only request was that the location fee be donated to the Plains High School Restoration Fund. Carter's old high school, incidentally, also appears in the movie as the site of Sam Peake's college reunion. The search for the right white dog was a difficult one for the producers. But they finally found a two-year-old Australian shepherd named Crystal. Crystal's trainers had rescued her from a dog pound at nine months and had been carefully training her ever since. 
but the distractions of the crew and all the equipment made it difficult for this young dog to concentrate on her role at times. To get the dog to respond to commands on camera, director Glenn Jordan issued an edict that Hume Cronin was the only one, except for the trainers, who could handle the dog. Cronin and the dog developed a strong bond. So strong, in fact, that while rehearsing the scene where Sam nearly drowns, Crystal became genuinely alarmed and rushed up and started licking Cronin's face. It was a touching moment. But the dog quickly lost interest and wouldn't repeat it when the cameras were rolling. The only way they could get her to lick his face was to smear peanut butter in Cronin's beard between takes. The scene was a memorable one in another way for Cronin because the actor decided to do his own stunt work, which involved getting out of the truck stalled in the middle of a stream, falling backwards into the water, and being carried off by the current. In addition to stunt work, driving a cantankerous old truck, and affecting a limp, Cronin also had to work on a southern accent. And he comes down out of the tree, and that may be a... I have to remember when I get back to the script that it's not quite the same voice and speech as I have when I'm just talking to you normally. Not that that isn't normal. That's perfectly normal down here, but it's something we have to learn. In Kay's novel, Cora has already died when the book begins. But screenwriter Susan Cooper felt that the audience needed to experience Sam and Cora's relationship to fully appreciate the loss that Sam later feels. But the changes did not bother author Terry Kay who was on the set. I know, because I've been around the uh, film before, I know that it, they're not going to say it the way I heard it, of course, but they say it beautifully and why should I worry? Uh, it's a, uh, that's one of the joys, I think, of writing something, uh, to know that it can be heard many different ways by many different people. And on this particular book, I've gotten so many letters over the past three years from people that I know are hearing it differently. The people who are 45 hear it one way, the people who are 20 hear it another, the people who are 85 hear it in a way that I don't hear it, because they know more about it than I do. Now look here, boy. You've been working on trees with me long enough to know that nothing ever stops. The old ones fall down, but everything goes right on because the young ones grow up. There are no real endings in this world, Bobby. Just discoveries. I love playing parts, old people, who still enjoy life till the very last moment. Who knows which one of us will go first, or whether we'll go together, or what. But uh, up until that time, life is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs>